Um, so, what, uh, what, what are envy and jealousy? I mean, people sometimes use them almost interchangeably, but in fact, um, from a psychological perspective, they actually mean very, very uh, particular um, uh, states. Um, envy is wanting another success, money, skills, attributes. Very often it's accompanied by a feeling of resentment, believing that somebody has come about these successes, money, skills and advantages unfairly. They were given some advantage that we don't have. Envy is, by the way, and I'll be talking about this, is very related to another psychological um, tendency called idealization which is idealizing other people, believing that they are always happy, peaceful, joyous, confident, um, and wanting to uh, have what they have. But idealization doesn't have the resentment of envy. It's simply idolizing someone, believing that they have a kind of saint-like, perfect stature where they don't feel some of the negative uh, emotional activations that we feel. Jealousy is fearing the loss of a beloved, generally uh, someone that we have a significant relationship with, uh, due to an interloper, somebody else appearing and taking away the beloved from us. So a child can feel jealous of a sibling, or somebody in a sexual or romantic partnership could certainly feel jealous of a competitor for the affections of someone they're interested in. So, um, both envy and jealousy, and in fact idealization, are in essence, known as secondary emotions, and they are subsets of a primary emotion, which is shame. What is shame? Well, shame is an emotional state that arises when we feel insecurely connected to a tribe, a group, a family, uh, a larger community. Human beings are pack animals, and we get our... Um, sense of security, our sense of validation, all of our positive emotions arise from feeling securely connected to other people. Uh, There's a work by a neuroscientist named Matthew Lieberman uh, called Social, and he wrote a book summarizing all of his uh, neural studies, and he showed that there's actually a part of the brain which registers physical pain but it also registers emotional pain. It's the exact same region, which is why sometimes when uh, we're sick or we're injured, we can also feel emotionally down, and why when we're emotionally wounded by a rejection or abandonment, we can also feel physically kind of ill, because they're using the exact same, it's literally the anterior cingulate cortex, for those of you who are frantically scribbling along. Good luck trying to spell that. Um... So, shame is a feeling of uh, a negative feeling that arises when we do not feel securely connected to the tribe. Human beings, as pack animals, we don't run fast, dig holes, climb trees, fly away from threats. But what we do do is we feel uh, secure because we have each other's back. We bond into groups, into tribes, and that's what gives us our remarkable survival advantage. And so it makes sense also, if you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, people who were emotionally rewarded for behaviors that uh, made them uh, feel or bond closer to a group of people would be more likely to pass their genes down. So people who shared their resources, people who acted in ways that benefited the tribe would be rewarded 
to do so by positive emotions such as joy, contentment, self-esteem, people who acted in selfish ways, who didn't share their resources after they had been loaned resources from other people, would feel uh, shame, and those twin emotional motivators would increase the likelihood that the people who experience such emotions would survive better, pass down their genes better. So it makes sense that over the 70,000 to 100,000 years that the human brain has been uh, pretty much biologically locked in, though that we've still developed these very strong bonding emotions, because that is what really lies at the core of our survival as a species. Now, shame given that it's based on a feeling of uh, insecure connection, very often uh, can be attributed to doing something that we regret, but that's not always the case. For instance, a child from an impoverished background can go to school wearing secondhand clothes and feel ashamed of the fact that they're not wearing clothes that will make other children um, accept them. It's not that they've done anything wrong, and they know that. They just are aware that there is something that is separating them from the tribe, thus the sense of shame. Likewise, in life, we can be dumped from a relationship and feel a sense of shame. Uh, and we've not done, we may not have done anything wrong. The person might have dumped us or rejected us simply because they found somebody else that they preferred. But still, we might feel a sense of shame because our sense of security and connection to other people has been diminished. So wherever there is a negative event to, that makes us feel less well-bonded, protected, connected, loved, uh, a part of, we will feel shame. And shame is one of the most powerfully negative emotional experiences. It's right up there with grief. Uh, which is also about loss. Uh, both shame and grief are very much the feelings of, of being deprived of something that we believe uh, is instrumental in our emotional survival and happiness. So it makes sense from a psychological perspective that when we feel shame, that we tend to mask it with secondary emotions that feel a little safer. What are these secondary emotions? Well, very often they are envy and jealousy. So envy masks shame with anger. The way it works is we generally are envious when we experience ourselves as being deprived of something that makes us secure, and then we look around and we find something in other people that uh, makes it easier to experience that deficit, that lack of security, and then we blame our own insecurity on the people who have something that we've decided makes the difference. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was um, living upstate, which was a terrible idea for me, look at me, I'm a neurotic New Yorker, what was I thinking? <laughs> I lost my mind. But it was one of those times in my life when I thought, well, I'm a Buddhist, I don't need all this New York nonsense, I'll go up into nature, the pastoral, the rural, and I'll I'll be amongst a, a more peaceful environment. Mistake, but <laughs> I did it. <laughs> so I, I was living up there in the early 90s, and it was a winter very much like this one, freezing, brutal, inhumane. <laughs> and uh, my car just would not start. I was driving a car given to me by my uh, father, one of the few th things that he actually 
uh, gave to me. I was startled when he did until I realized that it had 200,000 miles on it and required $1,000 worth of engine work before it would be able to continue driving. But I dutifully uh, tried to rescue the car, but it kept on breaking down. So I had this feeling of being up in the country, separated from you know, the urban environment that I loved. And so I looked around and suddenly it seemed that everybody was driving a really nice car. And I became very envious of these people in their nice cars. All I saw were cars being driven by beautiful people in beautiful cars. (laughs) Now, if I had pinned my... Obviously, what I was feeling was a sense of disconnection, vulnerability, insecurity, lack of connection. Those are painful feelings. I didn't want to sit with those feelings, so I decided, in fact, to externalize or project those feelings onto other people and onto something that I could easily attribute as being the difference. Look at all these rich people who get to buy any you know, darn car that they want to buy, why don't I get to drive a nice car? I'll tell you why. Because I don't have enough money. And they probably were given the money. This besides the fact I was actually given my car. (laughs) (laughs) So that's the way envy works. And I, I am very familiar with envy. Uh, virtually every every male friend of mine that I grew up with uh, in uh, when I moved down to um, I grew up in a very lower income neighborhood then I moved down to uh, the East Village in 1981 when it was just like a horror movie (laughs) and then uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I basically squatted there for a while, and then after a while, the it started being gentrified, and so all of my friends and I would gather around and uh, make uh, our bitter complaints, envious complaints about the people who gentrified, and then I made the wise decision of moving in the 90s to Williamsburg, where the exact same thing <laughs> happened all over again. So... Uh, But interestingly, I found that people I know who fall into the envy stories of constantly looking around at people and positing, you know, uh, that they've had it easy, that they've had life handed to them on a plate, that they've had their wealth and success provided, are almost invariably people who come from what's known as an avoided attachment style, who come from families where they felt uh, bitterly disappointed in their caretaking, and they just are set up to not allow themselves to feel the underlying feelings of uh, lack of connection, security. Every single person I know who gets caught up in constantly um, being just filled with resentment even though, and don't get me wrong, the system we live in is terribly wrong. It's unfair. People have, there's wild income dis- discrepancies. And hell yes, we should get rid of capitalism. But that's not the point. The point is, is that if we don't fixate on changing the system, if we fixate instead on envy and resentment, it means that we're masking feelings of uh, deficit, of poor connection, of not truly being loved. The people I know who come from secure attachment styles, who, um, who, are, who feel securely connected with other people, don't get caught up in envy, ever. They're always the one who says, let's take down the system. They're the ones who address the real issue. But people who feel wounded by early interpersonal abandonments by caretakers or uh, state place relationships where they felt were unreliable, where they should have gotten loved, are very susceptible to instead of focusing on the real issue, 
will become sidetracked by hatred and resentment and will start positing all these um, these sense, well, everybody who lives on Kent Street in those shining towers is, is living on a trust fund. None of them work for it like I did. So, um, it is related to idealization, which is pinning the saint-like um, uh, oh, this person's perfect. They don't have any fears like I do. They don't have any anger issues like I do. This person is wonderful. That's the borderline personality disorder solution, which is, oh, look at that. I want to be exactly like that person. Then what happens is they get a little closer to that person. They're like, ew, they have just as much worry and anxiety and fear as I do. Ew, stay away from me. You're terrible. So the problem is that Envy exacerbates the very issue it believes it's criticizing. People who get caught up in envy, wanting what, you know, the rich or beautiful or fabulously, you know, uh, you know, privileged have, are actually reifying materialism. They're saying, this is all that matters. It's money, it's wealth, it's beauty. That's what matters, and that's why I'm suffering, or that's why I feel insecure. So it, it actually points us not only in the wrong direction, it points us away from acknowledging the core, deeper feelings of abandonment that are yearning to be acknowledged, but it also reifies that which is the least deserving to be realized, the shallow materialistic society within which we live in where everybody believes security and happiness comes about by accumulating wealth and power rather than by connecting themselves compassionately and deeply with the people they love. Now, if envy masks shame with anger and resentment, uh, jealousy masks shame with a deflecting fear. I'll give you an example. Um, I use my own, my own life. That's good. I've got nothing to lose. I've, I've essentially emotionally disrobed myself in public so many times I've got, I've got nothing concealed. When I was a kid, I uh, grew up in a family that was very, very intellectual. Uh, immigrants from Russia, my mother, Jewish writer, very intellectual, my dad, a painter, loved the creative endeavors, loved humor, loved movies. The one thing that they weren't very particularly good at was any form of physical or sensual expression. I never saw my parents so much as give each other a gentle touch or anything like that. It was as if in the immigrant's manual, there was a big chapter at the front. You will not provide your children with any positive examples of, of sexuality or physicality or even the gentlest of touch because that would help them in their lives. <laughs> So, so I went into the interpersonal arena of high school and college, very well equipped to be uh, to feel permission to talk in front of people at times, to be uh, to share my ideas. But was I awkward in bed at first? Hell yes. I was beyond timid and shy and fumbling and, and with all manner of lack of confidence. I don't know why I'm shouting this for the world. <laughs> this is not what I'm supposed to be doing, but what the hell. Compensating for, for this. Anyway, so, um, so I felt a sense of and when I would be in a relationship at that time, because there was this felt sense of sensual or sexual deficit, I would 
immediately go into relationships with this feeling of anxiety in that arena, and then I would project it onto these imaginary interlopers that I would be convinced were going to steal away the girl that I was interested in. So, again, I would project that which I felt most insecure about onto somebody else. This is where we see both envy and jealousy at their purest. What they are showing us is that which we yearn for, that which we fixate on, that which we are constantly obsessed with in other people, are always those things that we feel the greatest deficit in ourselves. I would never feel any worry that a girl would be stolen away from me by a guy who was more intellectual or funny or creative because I felt no deficit in that arena. So it would never occur to me, there would never be the slightest jealousy there, nor would I feel any envy of people who have any of the attributes that I believe that I have. It's only with envy where I will feel a deficit and then I'll, I won't be able to explain the loneliness or the lack of feeling connected to enough people and then I'll fixate on something like, oh, those rich people in their shiny cars, that's what's making the difference. Or in relationships, I'll fixate on the one thing in my childhood that I felt I didn't have, which was sexual confidence. And so I'd say, oh, that's why I feel insecure. Not because of addressing the core insecurity, but by projecting it onto some interloper, some intruder, who I projected in a kind of idealizing way was... You know, every guy I saw would be interested in or would even look at a girlfriend of mine I projected as being perfect in bed. God damn them. Those simpletons, that's what they all have in common. They're effortlessly good in bed. <laughs> I don't know where I got that idea, but I really believe that for a while, you know. You, it's, it's because I'm neurotic, intellectual, and Jewish that I'm, <laughs> that I'm fumbling around here under the sheets. <laughs> It didn't occur to me that all I needed was a lot of, you know, practice and then things would be fine. <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell need, says we all need 10,000 uh, 10, hours to become a <laughs> genius. So I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> all right. Obviously, obviously, also, envy and jealousy and idealization points us easily at other people's externals, where it's so easy to compare against internal activations of shame or feelings of depth, self-deficit, and then it becomes very easy to fall into the trap of believing that other people's lives are easy and ours are difficult. That leads to cognitive dissonance in states such as um, uh, false attributions. There's another false attribution where people believe um, uh, if they've had a setback in life, it's because of the fault of other people. But if they've had a success, it's because of their hard work. That's an example of a cognitive dissonance. Another one, a cognitive dissonance, is looking around at other people and thinking, oh, they've got it easy. They have an unfair advantage. And I have to tell you, obviously, from uh, the experience of working and uh, counseling people, mentoring people uh, over many years, I see people across the, uh, the income spectrum, across the uh, spectrum of, of wealth, that suffering doesn't seem to... Uh, uh, recognize financial wherewithal. In fact, uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, a great psychologist, did a study of uh, a wide-ranging study, and he re and he came to the statistical uh, realization that once people get to a certain income level, 
at the time of the study, I believe it was $40,000. Uh, once they rise above it, there's no emotional advantage. They're working harder, but they're not getting any happier. So it's very easy to allow envy to create the story that if I had this or I had that or if I looked like this or if I looked like that or if I was given this or given that, that I wouldn't feel the way I do. But almost invariably, it's pointing us away from those areas that we need to investigate. So, wherever there is somebody who's jealous, there is somebody who is over-relying on one person in order to feel connected. And that's why they've pinpointed their fear towards some, that person being taken away. Again, Jealousy is an indication that we've overbalanced all of our support emotionally onto one person. We have not spread around the emotional support enough. Robin Dunbar, the evolutionary psychologist who wrote the wonderful title book, How Many Friends Do You Need? I kind of hate titles like that. <laughs> It just makes me feel like a lunatic when I'm riding around in a subway car with, you know, <laughs> how many friends do you need? <laughs> I had another book by another uh, Buddhist teacher called Be the Person You Want to Find. That just made me cringe when I open it. Uh, um... <laughs> So, but Dunbar posits that we need five close people in our lives to, to provide us with the core support that we need when we're disclosing our difficult, painful, emotional activations. We need to have five people. If you, if you rely on one person, we'll become uh, very thrown off balance if they're having a bad day or if their attentions are wandering away from us, or if they become unavailable, or if someone else seems to threaten the relationship. So where there is jealousy, it's almost a, a red flag saying that we need to really investigate how deeply can we connect with other people. We are... Uh, very often, what people who are jealous will do is they'll fall into the trap of uh, seeking reassurance from their beloved, you love me, 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 right? Uh, and of course, there's nothing though that will can be said that can alleviate an emotional sense of vulnerability that arises from the fact that we've overbalanced ourselves towards one person. We've not developed enough core key a wide enough emotional support network. Envy is an indication that there's an even more powerful underlying feeling of shame that's so strong that I have deflected it onto uh, a secondary object, such as money, wealth, uh, whatever. And this very often requires, in order to address to reflect on what are the times in life where I feel the happiest, where I feel the most content. That will be an indication of those experiences that I am seeking. Sometimes people misattribute what it is that's bringing them joy. I know one person who uh, was, she was always miserable, but then there was one time where she went to a, a kind of a, uh, a dance and she felt really, really great during the dance. She loved it and that lifted her spirits. And she attributed the sudden lift of mood to the dance and didn't realize, though, that it was the fact that she was around a large group of people who were... Uh, in a benign way, in a very welcoming way, paying attention to her. <clears throat> that was what was missing. She misattributed it to the fact that she was doing some dance. But it was really the feeling safely connected with a large group of people that was addressing the underlying need. 
So if we really investigate what are those times in life that bring us the greatest sense of joy and contentment and esteem, we'll almost invariably find that it's addressing some deficit that we are not paying attention to enough in our lives. The Buddha did offer some reflections that are very helpful in this regard. Um, he has a list of ten spiritual reflections that I find very happy. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, I'll just name um, a few of them. Deva Nusati, Sila Nusati, and Kaga Nusati. Deva Nusati is reflecting on people who care about us. People who've called us. People who've uh, emailed or reached out to us, people who've been there when we needed us. The brain has, of course, negativity bias. We will generally go back again and again towards abandonment, uh, rejection, stories of other people being insufficient or less than reliable. So we need to very often redress the balance by reflecting on those times that people have reached out. At the very least, Doing that helps us build up the confidence to believe with some sense of certainty that if we reach out again to other people, people will respond positively rather than negatively. Sila Nusati is reflecting on our virtue, the times that we've reached out to other people and the feelings that arose therefrom. So... uh, For example, there might be some time that we help somebody move. I would never do that. (laughs) Friends don't ask friends to move, but people are that nice. (laughs) Just being rigorously honest here. (laughs) There's nothing that makes me jump out of bail out of a conversation sooner than the the words, I'm looking for somebody to help me move on (laughs) Sunday. Where did Josh go? <laughs> but anyway, the time that we show up for people, we, we care, uh, and reflecting on the positive emotional states that arise afterwards, Kaga Nusati, reflecting on those skillful endeavors that we've developed in life, build up a sense of esteem that can allow us to feel better and less vulnerable in our lives. Finally, the Buddha recommends mudita, which is a way to reflect positively or feel a sense of appreciation of other people's happiness. But, let me say this, some people mistake mudita as like, uh, heaven forbid, they should try to feel good for Dick Cheney. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean feeling good for other people who came about wealth or advantages by harmful, unskillful ways. There's nothing in the Buddhist canon or the Buddhist teachings that says that we should feel good about people who have exploited others or who've been harmful. The Buddha saw karma only as a psychological teaching. He never taught that people are financially rewarded for doing harmful or exploited deeds. So, some I've heard some teachers fall, even teachers fall into the trap of believing. Well, if if somebody's really a jerk and yet they're rewarded for it, it must mean that they've done something skillful in the past. That's not karma. Karma is, if I do something skillful, I will feel emotionally better. It's a simple emotional teaching. It doesn't say anything about wealth, or about money, or about financial gain. That plays no role in the core karmic teacher. There's no teaching. There's no place where the Buddha says, if you act With kindness and compassion, you'll be rewarded with a lot of money. That's not the way it works. Not the way it works. So we can develop mudita, but it's mudita that makes us look around and find examples of people who have found happiness through generosity, through kindness, through sustained works 
that are altruistic or have simply developed a craft which brings them joy. Again, that will help us alleviate envy and jealousy. So, I hope there's something of value in tonight's talk that had shed some light in some way. I thank you for listening. So, through the meditation, occasionally there'll be sensations in the body or external sensations, sounds, or even maybe unpleasant or pleasant images that will pop up in the mind. All sorts of experiences will still happen. But because we are not focusing on the world around us, we're focusing internally beyond the opportunity to use the breath to relax the body, for example. You can use the breath as a way to create a safe container to become aware of the emotions and feelings that arise throughout the course of life. Generally, as we live our lives focused on laptops or computers or uh, external events, we're unaware of the gut feelings underlying intuitions. The somatic emotional experience that's going on all the time, for instance, during an unpleasant experience, the abdomen may tighten, the chest may tighten, the throat become constricted. In a pleasant experience, you might find your shoulders relaxing, the muscles in your face softening. So you're body-mind is constantly reviewing what's going on and the emotional mind is sending us either positive or negative reviews. These are what are called intuition. Non-verbal cues from the unconscious. So use this point as a time to familiarize yourself with the little activations that are occurring in the body. And just using the breath as a way to relax and be with whatever experience emotionally is occurring. So if you notice you're in a tired or frustrated mood, just be with that and use the breath to make it easier to stay present. If you notice you're happy and contented, still use the breath to create a safe container for that experience. Whatever the emotional experience that's principally nonverbal, be with it. And just use the breath as a self-soothing tool to help you do so.
So moving into the last third of the meditation. At this point, we'll be using the breath as an anchor to keep the mind from becoming too identified with any thoughts that arise. At this point in the meditation, feel free to allow images and thoughts to arise in the mind, to keep the breath also available so that you don't entirely climb into the thought and identify with it and live inside of it like a fantasy. So long as you know if you are breathing in or breathing out, that should be enough breath awareness. And when thoughts arise, Instead of identifying with them and fleshing them out, giving them more attention, see if you can label each thought. You can come up with your own way of labeling. Sometimes I'll label thoughts as worrying or reassuring, or thoughts about the past, or thoughts about the future. Thoughts that are loud or thoughts that are quiet. Thoughts that are insistent or thoughts that are laid back. See if you can come up with your own way of labeling your thoughts in a way that's informative, that begins to show you what kind of messages your mind is sending you all the time. Is your mind telling you to be wary? What is it telling you?
So we're going to begin the transition from the meditation, and as always, taking a few moments to reflect on building a sense of inner scheme for our practice, a recognition of the endeavor. No matter how easy or difficult any meditation may be, it doesn't really matter. If we're trying to develop some ease and peace within, we have in our lives a blameless source of peace of mind. Unlike other people who might be trying to consume or exploit or compete over objects and things trying to acquire peace of mind and happiness. If you have a meditation practice or any spiritual practice you're learning to cultivate states of contentment and joy and serenity using endlessly renewable resources that are your own. There's no side effects. It doesn't lead to any conflict with anyone. In fact, if you have a spiritual practice, you're less likely to get into needless conflicts. So this practice is not just to your benefit, it's to the benefit of all the people that you will encounter if you can develop even the slightest bit of emotion regulation and peace of mind through it. And when you hear the bowl indicating it's time to open up the eyes, See if you can do that slowly and keep some of your awareness at home in the body. Doing so, you can maintain a sense of balance in life, not being overly yanked about and pulled about by events and dramas in the world, but also maintaining some source of peace that's always available having a little bit of inner awareness allows us to not only regulate our reactions, but it also gives us a a refuge during really difficult times in life. 